I'm Chris Hassel from CBS Sports, and this is your Big Blue Nation preview. Number two, Kentucky, opening the season with a matchup at Madison Square Garden against number one, Michigan State. The Cats, four seasons removed from their last Final Four, seven seasons removed from their last national championship. Gary Parrish and Matt Norlander from the Ion College Basketball Podcast joining us now. And despite Gary losing three first round picks from last year's squad, kind of an unusually experienced team for Coach Cal, is it not? Yeah, it is. You know, he lost most of his best players like he always does for a decade now, but he did return some interesting pieces. I think most uh, obviously uh, Ashton Hagens. When you got a guy who was that big of a difference maker, especially on the defensive end of the court back um, in your backcourt, that's a good place to start. And when you combine a you know, consensus top three recruiting class with some interesting experiences pieces, um, that is usually the recipe for winning a lot of games in the sport of college basketball. Tucky is a fascinating team because Higgins, as GP noted, uh, is well known for his defense. I, I got a little bit of a hunch here that he might develop into more of an offensive weapon this season. If that winds up being the case, uh, I love Kentucky's forecast and projection for the season because the only other time that John Calipari, and this is not total causation, correlation, if you will, but the only other time that Calipari's brought back two starting level guards year over year and in the entire history of him being Kentucky's coach was 2014-2015 when the Harrison Twins returned, and that was the season Kentucky started 38-0 before losing in heartbreaking fashion to Wisconsin in the Final Four. No, this team is not going to be as good as that team, but I do think that this Kentucky team defensively will be top five in the nation and when you have Emmanuel quickly and Ashton Hagen's back and they'll team up with a kid named Tyrese Maxey who is going to be a lightning bolt of fun they've got a great chance at being really good and how about this GP I love it you and me we both agree this is the number three team in this in the country heading into the season the AP voters have them at number two Matt you mentioned that 2014 2015 team that's the last time that Kentucky reached the Final Four. It's, it's a drought, relatively speaking. It's absolutely a drought if you're a Kentucky basketball fan. Do they break it this season? I think they do. What's so funny is I actually happened to run it. Kentucky fans are everywhere. I ran into one recently, and he was lamenting over the, the, the fan base and the, not getting to the Final Four here. This is just they're on a, they're a different level. They obviously, Kentucky and Duke are the Alabama and Clemson of college basketball. This will be the end of the so-called drought because of the depth on this team, the defensive strength I think this team will have. And I think that overall, I like the fact that it's going to have a good three-guard attack and then a solid to better front court you know the fact that they return ej montgomery nick richards i know that those are not guys that now evaluate as top five players in the sec maybe not even top 10 players either of them overall but i do think that you will see again you know similar a little bit to the 2014 2015 team which had the platoon this won't have a platoon but you can get nine guys getting real minutes and by real minutes i would say more than 15 a game maybe as much as 20 a game here so i, I like i like what kentucky has overall yes the wildcats i think they will go to the final four in 2020 as do I. I mean, this is a team that's, that's built to certainly do it. And I, I would just make the point, I know at a place like Kentucky with a coach like John Calipari, uh, the standard is Final Fours and National Championships. Who am I to try to uh, suggest otherwise? But uh, I think from a fan's perspective, um, really all you can reasonably hope for or expect from your basketball coach is that he, one way or another, either by enrolling players and then uh, retaining them year over year and develop, develop them, uh, developing them into stars like maybe Tony Bennett does at Virginia, or if he's just enrolling five-star prospects, one-and-done guys year after year and molding them into a high-level basketball team every single season, almost without exception. Um, all you can hope is that you've got a coach who put you in a position to go to the Final Four every year, to win a national championship every year, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to argue that anybody for the past decade has done that more consistently than John Calipari. Uh, we've heard both of you guys talk about what a great backcourt they're going to have this season. And uh, the front court, you know, you're, you're missing some pieces there. At least you lost some in Johnson, in Travis, in Washington. Gary, is that going to be the potential weakness of this team? Uh, uh, relatively speaking, sure, if you've got to point to something. But as other college basketball coaches will tell you, Kentucky – um, it brings five-star bigs off of its bench. So just because some of these guys haven't played major minutes or haven't been um, huge contributors, um, they're still, still as heralded 
as the guys at other schools who were playing major minutes last season. They just could not get on the court because they had better prospects in front of them. And so Nick Richards dealing with an, an injury of some sort is a, um, a, a reasonable uh, preseason concern. Hopefully that's not a big deal. But ultimately, uh, this team is going to be stronger in the backcourt than in the front court, but still strong, I think, at all five positions. I do, too. And Khalil Whitney is a name to watch, a guy to watch. He's someone who... Uh, at least from what I've uh, from what I've heard in having discussions with with coaches and a few NBA guys, it's, there's a little bit of a split on his NBA potential, how high he could go in the June 2020 draft. But he's a he's sort of a power wing. I, I think that they do have a shot overall, Kentucky, to grow into a pretty strong front court. And if you'll allow me, Hassel, Nate Sestina is the guy that you need to know. He is a he is an impact transfer out of yes, the Patriot League. I don't think he'll be as uh, critical to this team as Reed Travis was when he came over from Stanford as a grad transfer last season. But I think he will still be pretty good. Average 15.8 points and 8.5 rebounds while playing for Bucknell. I, I hear good things already, and I think that he is the kind of player that can do a lot of different things in the front court. So just a name that's a, maybe a little bit under the radar for college basketball fans. No, I know Kentucky fans, they already know everything about every player on this mm -hmm. roster. But Nate Sestina, grad transfer, he could be the, uh, the unheralded key piece to ensuring Kentucky gets to that final in 2020. That's the player Matt Norlander is watching. Gary Parrish, who's your player to watch on this team? Um, I, I, I think it's Ashton Hagens. I mean, I love what he was able to do in spurts last season, and they just bring him back as a sophomore. Man, you know, we've talked about it before. It, it is hard to overstate how important non-freshmen are in the sport of college basketball, and when you get guys who could reasonably possibly be in the NBA right now but instead they're on your college campus and they're not trying to figure out how what you want from them what is expected from them um, from day one like a freshman usually is they enter the season with a a great understanding of all of that stuff it's it's a, a big advantage one that Kentucky doesn't always have they have it this season and if you look at John Calipari's best teams since he arrived in Lexington it is usually the teams where he's got um, a semblance of roster balance and this Kentucky roster in uh, you know largely because of a guy like Ashton Hagens they've got roster balance that's going to matter okay let's get to bold predictions Gary we'll start with you what's your bold prediction for the Kentucky Wildcats in 2019 2020 well when you think a, a team's great at all five positions in preseason top three it's hard to make a bold prediction um, on top of that but how about this uh, Kentucky will not win the SEC Maybe Florida does that, but Kentucky will still go to the Final Four and break this little streak of seasons that ended short of that. The streak doesn't go back nearly as long as almost anybody else's in college basketball uh, does, but it is one that Kentucky fans pay attention to. Um, I'm going to assume that even if Kentucky doesn't win an SEC regular season title, they'll be in Atlanta with us uh, playing in that final weekend. Bold prediction. We will talk about the Kentucky Wildcats through the first 60 percent of the season as though it is the dominant team, the favorite right alongside Michigan State and anyone else that is there because of this. Kentucky will lose in close fashion to Michigan State on opening night at the Champions Classic. Parrish and I will both be there, be podcasting after. Kentucky will not lose again until they have to go play Texas Tech on the road on January 25th in the SEC Big 12 Challenge. That's obviously a non-conference game. So by that point, uh, Kentucky will only have one loss when we are knocking on the door of February. That is, you wanted bold, Chris Hassel? That's bold. One loss until almost February for the Kentucky Wildcats. That is really bold. And if you think it's going to be a close game, maybe they can knock off number one Michigan State. Maybe they're perfect for the first three months of the season heading into that Texas Tech showdown. So those are bold predictions. How about regular season wins? The over-under is set at 24 and a half, Matt. I will go over, but I do think it'll be close because I'm – I think that Florida and Kentucky finishing tied atop the SEC standings is actually a real possibility. I don't put Florida that much behind Kentucky overall in that SEC race, but I will go over. I think Kentucky will lose five games max, and if you look at the regular season slate, that means they have 25 wins. I will certainly go over. I'm going to go over as well. Uh, I, I, like Norlander, think that they're going to pretty much run through um, the non-conference portion of their schedule. And I'm not ruling out a win in the Champions Classic. I can promise you it'll go better for them than it went in last <laughs> season's Champions Classic when they ran into that buzzsaw that was the Duke Blue Devils. But I'm not even ruling out uh, that um, we could enter the second week of the season and the number one team in the AP poll and the coaches poll and top 25 and one and everywhere else 
It, it could be the Kentucky Wildcats. All they got to do to do that is probably just beat Michigan State inside Madison Square Garden. And Michigan State, as we know, is going to be shorthanded. Josh Langford will not play. And that's Tuesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Madison Square Garden. The top four teams in the country will be in action. Fellas, thank you so much for the time. Gary Parrish, Matt Norlander can be heard on the Eye on College Basketball podcast. Download and subscribe today.